Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Some I haven't seen this weekend because you were enjoying the comforts of home and uh, putting your feet up and enjoying this wonderful weather that we've had. I thought I was in Wales yesterday. It was so wet, you know, but um, anyway, it's been lovely to be with you. And when I travel home later today, I will be counting all his benefits and singing that song. But I'll keep my hand on the wheel. I won't be doing that kind of stuff. That's a bit uh, treacherous, I think. Um, but it's, it's been lovely to be with you, and I'm very grateful. I've had the opportunity to come to spend time with my dear friend Colin. That's been a great highlight, and his family. And also to be with you as a church and to share God's word with you, which is always a, a wonderful thing to do. So thank you for allowing me, and thank, thank the Lord ultimately for arranging all of this over this uh, weekend. And as I go home, I, I do feel, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm taking lots of goodies with me. So, for example, even coming into church today, thank you, Joyce, for a little prayer. Uh, that was sweet. Um, they say time flies, and I now have my mosaic clock which is going to go in the boot, and as I fly up the A3, time's going to fly, isn't it, as I'm going up there. Thank you for that, Peter. And uh, many thanks to, well, to all of you for coming along and being involved, uh, as you have, and for your kind responses over this weekend. I've appreciate, appreciated that. You've been blessing me with different things, so just one or two things to, to mention and to give out uh, as I go home. Um, this is for Carol for doing a lot of cooking there um, for us. Um, so this is a cookie cutter. Make your very own Nelson. <laughs> and I'm sure Carol will love this. And she can not only, you can not only make your very own Nelson, you can eat him. So that's, that's for you. Uh, that's for Carol. Uh, for Colin, of course, so that you can see what that is. Can you? A military pin badge. Uh, in the form of a bullet. That's spot on for Colin. Um, I've, got <laughs> I've got Nelson's victory, Trafalgar and tragedy. That'll do me. Thank you very much. And then, the real, one of the real little highlights, because I knew this was coming, and it's in there. It's in there. You, can, you can tell I spent quite a bit of time on HMS victory yesterday, can't you? Um, I did want to get this. I'm going to take this home with me. It's going to be put up in some prominent place. Here we go. England expects that every man will do his duty. Thank you for that. Wonderful. And um, you might not think it, but that actually brings me to Matthew chapter 7. Very much so. Because we have a great commanding officer. In fact, the one who leads us is the high king of heaven. And he expects certain things of those people who say that they know him and are his followers. He expects every man and woman, every boy and girl who wants to be a true follower, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, he expects us to do our duty. Now, that's a dirty word these days, but I'm going to use it. It was the key to victory. They didn't just have the name. They experienced the reality of victory because every man did rise up and do his duty on that day. And so must we. And still for us today, this is the way to victory in a very different sense, of course. The victory we enjoy as the Lord's people is um, a unity and peace, and love, and truth in the church amongst the, amongst the disciples of Christ. And I think Matthew chapter 7 really will help us tremendously uh, in that sense, going in that direction. Now, when you look at this little passage, I mean, it was read to us earlier, it's very familiar to us, it's almost Sunday school material, we might think. It's not really difficult to understand, is it? I mean, the teaching of our Lord is generally in words of one syllable. 
It's not intellectually complex or difficult to understand. There's maybe one or two little things there we do need to clarify, and I'll try and do that. But here's my puzzle over the years. By observation and in my own experience, I have to say that this is one of those parts of the Bible, and I don't want to be too dramatic and overstate the case, but I, I'm, I'm trying to say it as I see it. This is one of those parts of the Bible that I generally do not see Christians putting into practice. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be awkward. I'm not trying to hurt anybody or, or be offensive. I, I, hope, I hope I'm not offending you by saying that. But this is my general observation, looking out, and it's certainly my experience looking in to my own heart and life. And it's one of the great reasons why we do not have the victory in our churches, in our relationships, as I think we, we can and we should. For example, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, um, recently, this was brought home to me again, and I guess this is partly why this is fresh in my mind. Two friends of mine, let's call them Dave and George, because you never meet them, but you never know. Uh, let's call them Dave and George, okay? They're in the same church together. They've been the best of friends now, they tell me, in the same church for over 50 years. Pretty impressive. But over that time, it has to be said that George has uh, fallen out with and offended just about everybody in that church. But Dave is his best friend. He's stuck with him all the way through. But things recently have got so bad that even old Dave is getting a bit desperate now. <laughs> and in fact, he's so desperate, he turned to me for advice. So he said, what can I do? What am I, how should I respond to this friend of mine, this dear friend of mine, who's just so awkward and difficult and he upsets everybody and people are leaving the church because of him? So he came to me for advice and you know what my advice was? I said, come on, let's have a look at Matthew chapter 7. And we read that together and I tried to say to him some of the things I'm going to say to you uh, today. In the course of which, Dave said to me, oh, you mean, so we've got this ministry where we've got to confront each other and, and correct each other, and, which is just another way of saying, you know, helping and loving and supporting each other. I said, yeah. He said, I couldn't possibly do that. I couldn't talk to my best friend like that. I mean, and anyway, I, I'm such a sinner myself, aren't I? I mean, who am I? Who am I to talk to other people like this? And anyway, he said, and he actually said this, right? The irony of it, he actually quoted this. He said, anyway, doesn't the Bible say that you mustn't judge other people? Judge not! And he didn't even know that he was quoting Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. So that's got to be our first step, because this stops a lot of people like that from moving on into this passage. That seems to be a catch-all. That, that ends the conversation. That's the end of that. So I can't talk to anybody or uh, deal with any issues because you mustn't judge, you know. So first point, it's got to be. You've got to understand what this is saying before you can put it into practice. So the opening verses. Let's just start with verse 1. And this opening verse, I mean, let's read what it says. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Of course, it does say that. But what does that mean? And it can't possibly mean what Dave is saying that it means. That somehow we can never criticize anybody about anything. Somehow we can never make right judgments about other people's behaviors. And, and that, by extension, means they can't do that to us or for us. When you think about it, the Lord Jesus was doing that all the time, wasn't he? Even in our passage, look at verse 6. He's talking about certain people as dogs and pigs. Now, almost certainly the false teachers, the false prophets who pop up later. In verse uh, 15, watch out for the false prophets. So the Lord Jesus is doing this all the time. 
And the whole thrust of the passage of what he then goes on to say with the speck and the plank, the implication is that there are times when we've got to do something like that as well. We've got to confront. We've got to correct. We've got to make judgments. But here's the point of verse 1. We've got to do that in the right way. And we've got to do that with the right attitude. It's not saying you can't make any judgments about anything. It's saying when you do make those judgments, you mustn't make them in a judgmental way. Indeed, you mustn't be harsh. You mustn't be legalistic. You mustn't be self-righteous and, you know, go stomping around in the church trying to sort everybody out in that way. You mustn't be like the Taliban in Kabul right now. That's what they're doing. That is a classic example of harsh, legalistic, ultimately man-centered religion. Don't be like them. Don't be like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. If you know the Sermon on the Mount, you'll know that the Pharisee is always standing there, at the, just off stage, as it were. And everything that Jesus is saying, he's trying to promote true righteousness amongst his people, but always, here's the contrast, to that lot there. Don't be like them. And that's really what verse 1 is saying. It's about having or not having the self-centered, legalistic, worldly, harsh, judgmental attitude of false religion. Don't be like the Pal Taliban. Don't be like the Pharisees. And there's quite a few Christians around in our churches, I've discovered, a little bit like that as well. So the Lord Jesus is not saying never confront, never correct, never criticize fellow believers. In fact, in what he goes on to say, really, he, that's exactly what he is saying. It's a sort of a command, really. You know, he'll actually tell us, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. But this is so important, so necessary, so powerful a ministry. This is like handling, you know, dynamite. It has to be done with great sensitivity, great care, great wisdom. So you've got to do it the right way. So that involves, first of all, understanding that, that opening verse, because many people, they never get beyond that, to be honest. And it's not saying what popularly, even in the church, people think it is saying. So let's sort that out first of all. Let's understand verse 1. But then we have to do something, uh, not for anybody else to begin with, the second thing, the second step in this process, we've got to do something to ourselves. We've got to do something for ourselves. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And then verse 5, first take the plank out of your own eye. So that's step number two. And we could summarize it like this, that we must deal radically with our own attitude. Verse 1, do not judge. Do not be judgmental. That's one way of putting it. And then that's elaborated by saying, take the plank out of your own eye. In other words, deal radically with your own sin, your own attitude, your own life, I mean, how dare you try and talk to somebody else if you haven't sorted yourself out? And the Lord Jesus uses quite strong language in verse 5. You, hypocrite. Who were the hypocrites just off stage? The Pharisees. They were doing it all the time. And Jesus was challenging them all the time. And hypocrite was the key problem they had. Because they weren't prepared to deal with themselves. They weren't pre prepared to self-examine, to search, to cor correct themselves. They were not humble. They were full of themselves, full of religious pride.
pride. So step number two then, deal radically with, your, with yourself, with your own attitude. I do think verse one, do, do not judge, don't have this judgmental attitude. I do think verse one is paralleled by verse three about the plank. Now this was a new, I think quite a new thought to me recently when I looked at it again. Because obviously, if you're going to deal with your life, you've got to get rid of this plank, these planks, these things that you know will hinder you and blind you. That means dealing with sin. You know, generally, we have to confess our sins, we have to repent, we have to humble ourselves, we have to get right with God, get right with one another. You know, so get that plank out. But in the context of this passage, I think verse one is paralleled by verse 3 and verse 5. And in the context of the Sermon on the Mount as a whole, what is the main problem that we will have in our Christian lives? It is self-righteousness. It is this legalistic, pharisaical, um, almost natural religiosity which can then become entrenched in a church or a denomination or, or, or whatever. So yes, you've got to deal with sin. You've got to get rid of sin out of, out of your life. But the Lord isn't saying we've got to be sinless or perfect before we can do anything. That's really what my friend Dave was saying. And I hear many people say that. And, and we're never going to achieve that. So we never will do anything then, will we, to help or correct anybody else. You'll end up doing nothing that way. No, there's something specific here that'll stop you helping others and correcting them in the right way, and that's the plank in your eye. This big thing, by comparison, your brother's sin is just a little speck. This is a big thing. This is a blockage. This is what blinds people. This is self-righteousness. The lifestyle, the attitude of the Pharisees. I think that's what he's saying in verse 1. And then he's taking us step by step through this process to deal then secondly with our attitude, deal with ourselves. Take, take the plank out of your own eye, the plank of self-righteousness. You are taking the place of God. You kind of know better than God. You know everything, therefore. And you know people's inner motivations. We never do, do we? You're not the judge. You're not God. But it doesn't mean you can't see people's behaviors and stuff that's happening on the outside that's, that's hurting other people in the church. Doesn't mean that you can't have something to say about that and that you can't speak to that. I think we can, I think we should, but it is vital that we deal with ourselves first of all. If we don't, again, verse 5, how dare you, you hypocrite? I mean, this is what the Lord Jesus is saying to his disciples. You know better than a bunch of Pharisees. How dare you? And anyway, how can you? How can you really, truly help others with a whacking great big plank of self-righteousness coming out of your head? That's the picture. It's quite funny. There's, I don't see many people smiling or laughing at the moment, but you're allowed to, because it's quite humorous. I think we should chuckle, but instead of saying amen, we should say ouch, because this comes very close to home, doesn't it? Very, very deep in our hearts. Again, the simple Sunday school teaching of Jesus is a sword that cuts to the depths of your soul, as it does here. And it's all about vision. It's all about seeing. You've got to see clearly so you can help others to see clearly. In one sense, it's as simple as that. I went to have an eye test the other day, as you need to from time to time. And of course, during the lockdown, we've not been having tests for this, that, or the other. So we're all, we're all, walking, uh, we're all walking miracles, the fact we're around at all, really. <laughs> in fact, I can see anything, and I've got all my teeth, and you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So time for an eye test. Imagine I go to the Boots um, Opticians on King Street in Hammersmith, and I'm sitting there waiting for the eye test, and um, 
And, you know, where, where is he? He's a bit late. And I say, um, I'm here for the eye test at quarter past 11. There's Mr. Jones here. Oh, yeah, he's the man over in the corner there. Well, he's the optician, yeah. You mean the man with the dog and the white stick? Yeah, yeah, that's Mr. Jones. He'll see you in a minute. Okay. So he's walking around in the opticians. He's bumping into things, you know, and says, uh, is Mr. Berry? Yeah, follow me. And we go into a little darkened room, in fact, in total darkness, because he can't see anything, because it doesn't make any difference to him. And all he can say is, you know, the, uh, this is what I used to get as a little boy. It's a bit more sophisticated now. Which is better, red or green? And that's what we get for half an hour. Would you have any confidence in an optician like that? Would you think that he could really help you? And when eventually the spectacles do arrive, would you be surprised if actually they're worse than what it was like before? Here's the simple point. Take that plank out of your own eye so that you can see to help others to see. You yourself have to be able to see clearly, first of all. Imagine putting up the sign. All are welcome, Mr. Jones, blind optician, taking, taking orders. <laughs> I mean, he's not going to get many clients, is he, really? Of course. You've got to deal with yourself, deal with your own attitude. Phariseeism, self-righteousness is always snapping at our heels. You've got to deal with that in you. But that's not the end of the process. We're not talking about spiritual perfectionism and purification. You do that so that you can see clearly and you can then go and help others to see clearly. Go back to my friends now, Dave and George. So this is what I was saying to Dave, or something like this, you know. Dave, you've got to understand. You've got to understand what the Lord Jesus is teaching us here. Your way of looking at verse 1 is wrong, actually. You see, I'm doing it now to him, aren't I? <laughs> this is what it looks like. No, my friend, my brother, that, that's not the right... Let me, let me try and explain to you what verse 1 really means. And then this thing about taking the plank out of your own eye. Oh, okay. So we went through that a little bit. You've got to deal radically with yourself. You prepared for that, prepared to be humble... Prepared to be open about your own issues in life? Well, um, yes. Step one, step two, step three. This is where it, it gets really hard. Because then, Dave, I said to him, and then, friends in Gosport, I say to you, and then, Keith Berry, I say to me, and then, you've got to do something. You've got to face up to your responsibility. Then, you've got to act. Then, say, but get back to Dave, you've got to go to George. You've got to get very close to him. Imagine taking a speck out of somebody's eye. Can you do that at a distance? On the other side of the room? Can you do that on the phone? Can you do that by WhatsApp? Can you do that through an email, getting a speck of dust out of somebody's eye? You try it sometime. Can you do it, that on a Zoom call? You have to physically, personally, you've got to get so close to that person, it's almost frightening. And you have to be so delicate and so gentle and so kind and so compassionate and so loving and so helpful and such a servant. That's what's involved. And that's what it means to confront and correct a fellow brother or sister in Christ. To sit down, this is what I said to Dave, to sit down with George and say, hey George, we've got a problem here. We need to talk. It could be as simple as that. Now we can do that, can't we? We can all do that, can't we? But then Dave said, oh come on. You're not serious. I mean, this is my best friend in the church. I've known him for 50 years. Don't see what difference that makes. Is that more important than the Word of God? Well, these emotional ties, these relational ties, they, they do affect us profoundly. Uh, uh, th this came home to me again with these dear friends of mine. 
course they do. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, even when we understand a passage like this with absolute crystal clarity, even when we're told what we must do step by step by step by step, we understand it, we know it, we know what we've got to do, and then we don't do it. And the thing that came home to me again, and again, I'm not, please, I'm not, I've not come all the way to Gosport to point the finger at you. I'm, I'm, first of all, dealing with myself here. This is my issue. I know myself better than you do. And the conclusion I've come to about a passage like this, which in a sense is so simple and so straightforward, why we don't generally see this being practiced in our churches, I think we lack courage. I think this applies to the issue from last night. I won't go back over that again. That's courage in society. This is courage in the church, in our relationships with one another. And again, I, I'm going to say this, and I, I'm not trying to hurt anybody or be awkward or difficult, but we lack courage because we lack love. Because the one flows out of the other. Now, there is love in our churches. I'm not saying there isn't any love in, in our churches. That would be ridiculous. Of course, there's a lot of love. But often, particularly when we face these stressful, pressurized, conflict situations, some of that love begins to ebb away. And that's when this courage, which comes from love, is so needed. And you know true love? What is love? Where does love begin? First of all, it's love for the Lord. It's love for His Word. And it's love that obeys. And then that overflows in love for people. And part of that, it's only, one, it's only a strand, but it is one part of true love, and it's an important part. And again, we've neglected it, we've forgotten it perhaps, is love that confronts and corrects. Now, that could have a wonderful effect on George, couldn't it? Dave goes to see his friend. They sit down together. They have that conversation. It could be that, uh, you know, because it's all about vision, seeing things clearly. It could be that George's uh, eyes are open. Look what I've been like. Look what I've been doing all these years. And he falls on his face, weeping and wailing. And there's repentance and there's reconciliation. And the confusion and chaos that's been in that church for about... For about 50 years, oh, that's interesting. I wonder, you know, wonder what the connection is there. Um, you know, it's dealt with, it's healed. There, there, there's a change that takes place. Or it might not happen like that. It might actually cause George now to turn on his friend, his best friend apparently. How dare you speak to me like that? Who do you think you are? I've been in this church for 50 years. No one's going to speak to me like that. I thought you were my friend. I'm off. Or rather, probably, you should go. <laughs> probably more the response. And actually, George turns on his friend and rejects him. There's always that possibility, sadly. There's always that risk when we begin to truly love in reality, in depth, like this. So that's why we need great courage. And that's where love like this can be very costly. And that's also where we need great wisdom. So let me just finish with that, verse 6. And this is probably step four of a process now. All of that is kind of positive, hopeful, looking forward to a change, a restoration, a transformation, winning people. It's, all about, it's not about hurting people, is it? It's not about punching people up because you don't like what they're doing. That's not what we're talking about. That's the Pharisee again. No, this is about being humble, taking the lower place. This hurts me. This is going to cost me to, to do this. Of course it is. It's my plank that I've got to deal with before I can help you with your spec. So we go into this humbly, prayerfully, lovingly, hopefully, that something will happen. 
in the way that I've said, but not always. So verse 6 is interesting because it says there are times when it's not going to work and you've got to be prepared to let people go. Now verse 6, it's a very strong verse, isn't it? Don't give dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and then turn and tear you to pieces. Now, I think probably, almost certainly, this is talking about the false prophets because they're mentioned later in verse 15. This is extreme and severe language, and it probably applies there. But I think it could be applied, and it does slip in just after this little passage about the ministry of encouragement, of correction within the body. And it certainly has an application in this way because these pearls that are being shared could be those pearls of advice, those pearls of correction in the way that I've discussed. Um, And that's exactly what verse 5 is saying. Take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So it could be a reference to that, those pearls. But then what if people actually won't listen at all. Have you ever had this experience as a pastor? It doesn't happen to me every week, but it does happen from time to time. People who, they won't be corrected. They won't listen. They won't even meet you. They won't even take your phone calls or reply to your emails. Well, you can't be going on like that, can you? You can't keep banging your head against that brick wall. That's pointless and actually quite dangerous. This is a dangerous thing described here in verse 6. You're actually stirring up and generating more conflict that way. And actually, think about it now. When somebody stops speaking to you and they stop listening to you, I think that conversation is over, isn't it? At At least for the moment. It doesn't mean you abandon them. It doesn't mean you reject them. It doesn't mean you have anything, never have anything more to do with them. You've taken the steps as I've explained them, but then you have to come to this conclusion. There's just no way forward now. Don't, don't do it, the Lord Jesus says. In other words, withdraw. You can go on praying for that person, You can go on loving that person, of course, always. But sometimes the wisest thing to do is to let that person go. I haven't got time now, but I mean, the Proverbs is full of this sort of thing, isn't it? Proverbs 9 and verse 8 about reproving and those who will not listen. So it's quite interesting to to go back to the book of Proverbs and think about that. Well, let's finish. I'm taking my little plaque. I'm going to put it in my pocket, and I'm going home in a minute. And I'm reminded that England expects, it says, well, our heavenly commanding king, commander, officer, he expects us. We have duties to fulfill as the Lord's people. But he doesn't just expect things of us. We go back to where we started over this weekend. When did I first meet you? It feels like weeks that I've been down here. I mean, I mean that in a good sense. Yeah, it feels like years for you. Yeah, thanks, Colin. (laughs) No, I mean, I mean, that's that's always a good feeling, you know, when you feel kind of refreshed and, oh, this has been great. So, yeah. But where did we start? We started with, with the cross, the cruciality of the cross. So it's not just that that our commander expects us to do things. He's done what is needed for us, and we're going to take the bread and the wine in a moment. He's done what is needed to liberate us from sin and judgment and false religion and self-righteousness. We don't have to be like that. He died on the cross, and he rose again to deliver us from all of that. And then he gives us the power. He anoints us. We experience the energy and the the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can do 
the word of God. But my friends, you still got to do it. And we've still got to go back to Matthew 7, step by step by step. Very simple, basic teaching from the Master about our relationships within the body of Christ. You've still got to do it. And that is still the way, the only way to get victory in the Christian life and the Christian church. You know, it's one thing to have the name victory over the church, isn't it? There are churches, you know, Victory Christian Fellowship or something like that. It's one thing to have the name on the notice board. This is how we get the reality in our experience, the victory in the church of relationships which are wise, which are humble, which are loving, which are changing, which are filled with the power, the grace, the goodness of God in the gospel. That's certainly there in the Proverbs, so, you know, maybe go back to some of those Proverbs. That's certainly what this passage is teaching. I hope that's You know, I hope I've been able to get that across to you clearly today. But there's probably no verse in the Bible that sums it up better for me, and I'll finish with this, than Ephesians 4 and verse 15, which says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him, who is the head, that is, Christ. Amen.